Hello, everyone. I wish I spoke Finnish. <laughs> and I don't know. But I felt your talk, Rasa, and I um, could tell it was just the heart of this organization. Um, so thank you. And you reminded me just in your spirit of the children and the youth and the young men and women that result from Friends of the Children as well. So thank you. Um, I just want to start by thanking Iceheart, uh, Veal, Erica, everyone has been so incredible to invite Friends of the Children to participate in learning about your program and experiencing your beautiful culture, uh, meeting your researchers who are doing such a wonderful job, um, and most importantly, getting to play with your children. <laughs> Yesterday I had a, had a lesson in floorball that I was really excited about, um, but to meet the kids and to meet your educators um, and to really feel uh, the sense of kinship between our organizations um, is, is really, it's invaluable. Um, so, you know, a little bit about my background. When this invitation came up, everyone in, on my staff at Friends of the Children said, ah, oh, you're the perfect person to go. Uh, my background um, is in research. Um, however, I, I'm really most committed to practice. And I started my career um, after law school um, with creating a sports mentoring program for children um, coming out of the juvenile court system, um, teenagers who had, had struggled with challenges and gotten involved with the court system um, and were in rehabilitation. And uh, I, really, I helped them get connected to running and track, and they wrote, did some road races and competed together, with, matched with volunteer mentors. Um, and it was in that work that I came to realize that for many of the boys and girls that we worked with, um, I wish I had started sooner. That these, the children, by, when they were teenagers, the, if I had had an opportunity to, to inspire them through mentorship when they were children, uh, to play and do team sports and to do enrichment activities that maybe they wouldn't, with, and meet other boys and girls that were, that were into the same thing they were, that maybe they wouldn't have ended up where they were with such challenges. Um, and... Uh, and you know, in getting to know Erica and Viel this week, I understand it's a very similar path that they were on. Um, that they, you know, Viel was working with in, with children and youth in foster care homes, and and Erica was working with youth in juvenile court. And we all believed that we needed to start earlier. And so for me, that led me to this organization, Friends of the Children, um, and our founder, Duncan Campbell. Um, so, you know, it's been so interesting seeing the similarities between Duncan and Veal. Uh, they are kindred spirits in every way. Um, from when I first arrived, um, if Duncan had you, if you were in Portland, Oregon, he, the first thing he would do is put you in his car and drive you around town and show you the house he grew up in, show you the, the places in his community that inspired him to start Friends of the Children. Um, and, you know, the mission, the alignment between our two organizations is um, incredible. We must start early. We must have, begin with prevention. We must dis identify the children who need us the most and work with the children who need us the most and stick with them, make a long-term commitment uh, to be there no matter what. For our organization, we start with children at ages five and six, and we, st we make a commitment that we will stay with them no matter what until they graduate from high school, which is around 18 years old. Um, and then also, we are committed to research of learning how to be effective uh, with the programs because we have such a short amount of time, even though it's 12 years, our amount of time each week, each day with these children is so precious and we need to make every second count. And that we want to share what we learn about our program with others because we all believe that we need to change the way this, our countries make investments in children. 
So I'm going to show you, I'm going to try, I'm horrible at computers, but I'm going to try to show you a, um, a video um, that I think is going to ring very true for you. Every child grows up with a head full of stories. And stories are powerful because the ones we believe about ourselves shape the way we live, the choices we make, and ultimately the story we write for ourselves. For many children growing up in the cycle of generational poverty, the story often goes like this. You have no future, no potential. There's no way out of the world you're born into. Your highest hope is just to survive, just to make it through realities like abuse and neglect. And when you're born into this kind of story, it's not just that your resources are limited, but your vision is limited and your choices are limited. And under the weight of this story, it's nearly impossible for a child not to become the liability they already believe they are, to give up on school, to fall into substance abuse, to become incarcerated, to become parents in their teens. And when they believe this story, a child is destined to pass on these patterns and cause the cycle of generational poverty to continue. And when this story perpetuates across the 2.2 million children in poverty, across cities, across generations, so does the cost that it takes on society. But what if someone were to step in and tell a different story? What if someone said, you're not a burden, you're not a liability, you're an immensely valuable asset, a person that is worth investing in. For over 20 years, Friends of the Children has been telling that story. Friends of the Children is a nonprofit organization that's transforming lives and breaking the cycle of poverty through the power of relationships. We've found that all it takes is one person to show the way out, one person to stay by a child's side for the long haul, no matter what, to enable them to thrive. To that end, children who enter the program are paired with a friend who will guide and support the child for their entire 12-year journey through school, from kindergarten to graduation. These friends are full-time, paid, trained professionals who help children live out a better story every day. This kind of commitment has monumental effects on the system of poverty. Although 60% of these children have had parents incarcerated, 97% avoid the juvenile justice system. Although half of these children have parents who dropped out of high school, 85% graduate. Although 85% of these children were born to a teenage parent, 98% avoid early parenting. These kinds of breakthroughs have the power to change our entire economy. The Harvard Business School Association of Oregon estimates that helping one child live out a new story can save the United States around $900,000. Each dollar invested in a child returns seven to the community. And what those numbers fall short of capturing is the immeasurable value of changing a life. At Friends of the Children, we've seen success, but there are millions of lives. The price is high, the demand is high, but the rewards are higher. Millions of children need to hear a truer story, a more hopeful story, one with a happy ending. Become a part of that story today. Okay, so let's just tell you a little bit about our model. Um, we, fr at Friends of the Children, um, we, do, we do our best to identify children um, early um, and then match them with a paid professional mentor that we call a friend. Um, and that friend stays with them again for 12 and a half years. Um, we, we go through um, a pretty rigorous child selection process that I'll explain a little bit later, but um, the, the children that we work with in general we spend six weeks in the classrooms um, of kindergartens, observing children, getting to know them, um, seeing which children may be displaying some aggressive behavior or perhaps are more withdrawn in the, in the classroom. Um, children who may um, be hungry, may need, look like they need some, some clothes for school, um, that the teachers and counselors have an idea that their family is facing some challenges. Um, so our friends are actually in the schools doing a, um, a risk and protective factor assessment that's been codified by our researchers um, to identify the children who we think meet, need us the most. Um, we also now um, are selecting children from the foster care system. Um, so children who are in foster care, um, this, the counties are referring children to us as well. And these are, the, are some of the risk factors um, 
that they are faced with. Um, many of our children have parents who've been incarcerated. Um, many of them, the parents, their parents um, did not graduate from high school. Um, uh, were in the foster care system. An overwhelming number of our of the parents of our children were teen parents themselves. Um, and so this cycle of, of challenges is something that we are hoping to inspire um, a sense of, of, of hope and being able to overcome. And so the, and once we select the children into our program, we spend a lot of time talking to the parents and asking the parents what their, their hopes and dreams are for their children. We do home visits to really get to know them, meet them where they are, um, and, and and give them an opportunity to to talk to us, so that because it's a precious gift to be able to work with anyone's child um, that we take very seriously. Um, who are our mentors? We call them friends. Uh, one of the interesting things I've I've encountered this week is. How, what, how do we define this profession of an educator, of, a, of what, what you are doing in the classrooms every day? Um, we struggle. We call them friends. Um, they're mentors, they're advocates, they're coaches, they're educators, um, and they're just wonderful people. Um, we, we pay everyone full -time, a full-time salary. Each friend works with 8 to 12 children, um, and, and we ma we've made it a profession. Uh, the average age of our friends is 30. Um, they've all have had a background in working with children, um, and uh, they represent the communities of the children that we serve, with over half of them um, coming from diverse backgrounds. Um, and how do we train our friends? What are we looking for in a friend? Uh, we've developed base competencies of what we see a friend role as being. And one is the ability to collaboratively set goals. Um, being able to work with children on their goals and the steps that it takes to achieve those goals um, is, a, is a trait that is we we look for it and we train an ongoing support around. We also want friends who are able to, to meet the diverse needs of the children that we serve, to really understand trauma and the impact of trauma and poverty um, and how to help children navigate through that and build the resiliency that they need to cope and overcome um, and become thriving children, thriving individuals. Um, the friends also do a, a lot of advocacy in the schools. Um, I, I loved the term, and we use it at Friends too, bridges. They're bridges. They're bridges from the school to the home to the different services that the, that the families are receiving. Um, for those children that are in foster care, this is a huge part of the friend's job because it's so confusing, at least in the U.S., navigating all the different requirements and services and counseling that the children need. So the friends are there um, in the school, in the home, in the community. Um, and uh, that's something that is very important. And we also recognize, the friends also have to recognize the role of data, um, of using data and the appreciation of using data to intentionally inform their work with children. They can't be afraid of that. That might not be their biggest strength coming in, but they have to be willing to try. <laughs> um, and the third piece is we commit for the long haul, as I mentioned, 12 and a half years for every child. We start at age five through the age of 18, no matter what. We stick with them within a 30-mile radius. Um, if they move, if they change schools, um, we are there. And you know, I was having lunch with one of your educators today, and as the kids get older, they change schools. You know, you may, you may, you have a team of ice hearts in elementary school. Well, by high school, they may be in nine or 10 different schools. And so our friends really need to be able to navigate and be confident to initiate new relationships with, with school personnel. Um, and, and so, you know, this is just, again, our individualized attention. The one difference that I think that um, we've been noticing this week, um, but it's, it's a compliment, is that Friends of the Children um, is initially very focused on one-on-one. -on -one. Um, individual relationship building. So each friend is met 
has eight children on their caseload, but particularly in the elementary school years, their job is to work, devote three to four hours a week one-on-one -on -one with that child. Um, and then we integrate the group programming. Um, so it's a little different than Ice Hearts, um, but you know, our goals are the same. Um, one of the big things we believe in is wanting to build social capital and social network of the children. Um, you know, research, we're learning more and more about the importance of research that, that to break down some of the issues of inequality and inequity, that that concept of building strong social networks for children and families is so important. Um, and that is definitely something that um, we, we believe um, our friends are, are doing. Um, one of the things that uh, Erica brought up early on that um, I think my first phone call that it was so striking to me when I asked about our, who are the children, um, and you mentioned loneliness, so, you know, what are the, some of the challenges they're facing, and you mentioned loneliness, and um, that term just struck Sarah and I on the phone because we use it all the time. We use the concept all the time, but not in such a personal nature as identifying with our kids. But you, that is exactly what our children are facing. And we use terms like social isolation and marginalization. But what's really going on is, is children and families feeling isolated because of some of the challenges they've faced. And, they, they, and so if we can help be that bridge and connect them and, and help, help children and families be able to get connected to advocates all around them in their community, we've done a good job. Um, so that is a lot of our intentional work. And so we do that in the home, in the school, and in the community. Um, but a lot of, uh, another piece that I, I found interesting that we talk a lot about is, so people will say, okay, you have these great outcomes, you do this, this magic with the children in the schools. Well, what is that magic? You know, what is that secret sauce? And so, you know, similar to Ice Hearts, um, when Duncan started Friends of the Children, he said, go love the children. That's what we want you to do. Love the children. Um, the, tr the three, the very beginning trainings of, of Friends focused on three things. Be with the children. Be together. And be yourself. Um, and that really is still the cornerstone of Friends of the Children, just as it is for Ice Hearts. Um, and we also realized as we started growing and having a bigger staff around the country, we are now uh, 15 sites and almost, we'll be at almost 2,000 children soon, that we had to also start thinking about how to create that sense of intentionality using the research. What is it that the Friends do? every day that allows them to achieve these outcomes. And, and it really, the anchor of it is, is the, our social emotional learning skills. We call them core assets. So we went back to our, um, a couple years ago, we went to our uh, team of, of friends and staff and we said, what sort of skills are the skills that you are, are working on with the children? Um, and we went to the research and looked at research on, on skills that have been proven to increase academic performance and increase career and, and life outcomes for children. And um, I'm sure you're, and, and, you know, please, if you have any questions or comments around these, stop me at any moment. I'd, I'd love to take questions and um, have this be more of a dialogue. Um, but these were the, these were the nine core assets that our friends said, this is what we do every day with kids. This is how we help them achieve their outcomes. Growth mindset, um, Carol Dweck's research on a love of learning, you know, kids being curious and always wanting to learn and, and having that perseverance. Another wonderful researcher, Angela Duckworth, um, who talks about grit hanging in there, even if things get tough, even if you, you don't think you can, you can accomplish the goal you've set for yourself, being able to recalibrate and stay in the game. I know that's what Ice Arts teaches. I saw it yesterday on the court. Um, Self-determination, that idea of believing in yourself and believing that you have control over your own future. Um, uh, 
and self-management, particularly in the early years, um, we, we spend a lot of time on self-management, the idea of being able to manage your emotions um, and being able to be in a classroom environment and get your work done and handle frustrations, um, as well as building those personal relationships that you need. Um, so, so some of these, so we, every single day that the, our friends go out into the community, we are wanting them to identify which core assets they're going to work on with the children that they're with and attach that to the different activities that they're doing. Um, and this is our, our program model. Um, we start with our three long-term objectives, which is high school graduation, and then avoidance of juvenile, juvenile justice and avoidance of teen parenthood. And that was something that Duncan chose those three outcomes um, back when the organization started. Um, we basically want every child to be successful. Um, and so we, these intermediate outcomes, we need, as you guys do, you know, you've got, you start at six and you go to 18. Well, what are the outcomes that you're looking for uh, during those intervening years that will lead to your long-term outcomes? And over the years, these are the areas that we, we, we set out. And we have indicators of what we identify as the success in each of those intermediate outcome categories. So for school success, it's academic performance, attendance, competency. Um, in the pro social emotional area, it's having positive friends. Um, and also, we, we track uh, the social connections, how many other caring adults besides our friends do the, do the children have in their lives. Um, improved health, nutrition, physical activity, ice hearts, it fits right in there. Um, making good choices, those extracurricular activities, out of school time, are they doing, not getting involved with risky behavior? And then are they having career goals and, and what are they thinking about for when they, when they grow up? Um, and so we have the kids set goals every year in those five, out of, those five categories. They sit down with their friend, they, they decide together what their goals are gonna be for the year. And, um, and then we, this is really the operational side of Friends of the Children, um, where we want, we through these different strategies of one-on-one -on -one relationships, um, advocacy, developing these goals, group programming, um, we have the, the Friends work on these core, developing core assets to achieve those, those intermediate outcomes. Um, and we found that you know, ha once we developed this, this theory of change, um, it really helped our friends. It helped the supervisors of our friends be able to coach better. We all were using a common language. It's really improved, I think, the culture of Friends of the Children because we have these, these pillars of values that we say um, we want every children to achieve. And then the fun part is that the kids, they, we start using the language and they start realizing where you know, what they're good at. So, I mean, they're good at everything, but they have strengths in certain areas. So, you know, I can think of one little boy, John, right now, who is very, he perseveres. And some may call him stubborn. <laughs> Others would say he perseveres. And so, of course, we, we spin everything and frame every behavior into a positive. And, and so John, he knows. He, he perseveres. He's going to stick it out on that basketball court, you know, Till the, we turn the lights off, and that's that's really what we want to see. Um, so these, so we've created uh, in our different offices around the country. We have those core assets are branded. They're on the walls. They're on every everything that we do. Um, and our staff also owns the the core assets as well. So when we do professional development, our staff is also having to own and and identify with those those core assets. Um, does anybody have any questions or? I don't know. I feel like I'm talking a lot. Yeah. I would like to know how you take care of your friends, uh, about their mental health and the go on. Yeah, and I, um, it's, uh, I'm so sorry. I know this week is really difficult and um, uh, losing anyone is is so tough and we have certainly had challenges at friends of the children as well of um 
losing children. We've had quite a few children um, who have, have passed away and or have gotten into really serious trouble. Um, and our friends bear so much on their shoulders um, with the individual relationships that they are forming and being in the home and in the school and really getting to know children for 12 years. Um, it's a family. Um, and so we do a lot of self-care. Um, we, each friend, group of friends, we have teams. So the friends, there's four or five friends that um, we have a team leader who supervises those friends. And so they meet weekly um, together and um, are able to work through different issues together and get some peer-to-peer -peer learning. Um, and then we also do a lot of self-care. Um, you know, the, one of the beautiful things about being a friend, just like your educators, is that it's a flexible job and you're out and you're about. And so we want to make sure that it's easy to do, like yesterday I was asking, I think, Tommy or one of your educators, I was like, well, how, you know, how you're in the schools all day and then you're also doing after-school programs and, and you have to have time for yourselves and your own family. So we do a lot, very regimented, using data um, to, to make sure that the friends are um, tracking their time and taking that time off. Um, but that's a really good question. <sighs> it's important work. So um, one of the things that's so important is data and measuring and, and using it to improve the work that we do. Um, and our, you know, it, it definitely has been a cultural evolution of friends from love the children to being in this place of loving the children and measuring our work. Um, but the number one goal of everything we do is to improve youth outcomes and improve the quality of the services to the kids that we serve. Um, the second is, and then we've also been engaging in, in some new research around what is our value to society? How do we, how do we develop an economic model about the work that we do? Um, and then we're also, because of our entrepreneurial roots, um, we are all about innovation. We're all about looking to see where should we be? We're here now, but where do we need to go? Um, and so we use data um, and evaluation to help us with that as well, because that also defines our boundaries. I mean, very similar to Ice Hearts, it's so much to want to be all things for all people, but we need to use, we use data and our evaluation strategies to say, this is what we do best. And there are a lot of other organizations that we can partner with to do other things, um, but it helps us keep our, rein ourselves in so that we, we do have self-care. Um, and so over the last, I'd say, seven or eight years, we've really made a commitment to using data um, in a way that is helpful. Um, we, from the very beginning, when it comes to our child selection process, um, we are doing a, a codified risk and protective factor analysis um, because our program is not for all children um, and it's very expensive. So we want to make sure we're working with kids who are going to benefit the most. So our child selection process is codified. Um, and, we, and then we, we started using a database system. Um, I know Erica was chatting with me about it, yes, the other day of excitement, but who knows. It's, a, it's called Efforts to Outcomes, and it's a, it helps us manage the efforts of our friends while we're tracking the progress of the children. Um, and so every, every child is, um, um, every friend, rather, is um, inputting into our database. They're planning their activities for the week. This is what I'm gonna be doing with, the, with each child. Um, this is, these are the core assets that I'm gonna be working on. Um, here's the intermediate goal categories. And you know, some of them, are we spend more time in than others. I would say every friend is working on pro-social skills every week. You know, every friend is working on academic skills every week. Um, but, we do have um, you know, a limited amount of time. One of the things I didn't get to talk about here in our model, oops, is um, that's important distinction between friends and ice hearts, is that we're not in the schools as much as, as your folks. It's one of the things I'm excited to take back to our, I think we could learn from. Our friends are required to be in the schools um, to at least 
two times a month, um, make school contacts. In the early years, though, they have to be in the schools once a week. Um, but they have to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with teachers two times a month for the full 18 years. Um, the other thing is, is we have two caregiver contacts required a month. Um, but the reason I say this is that we're now taking, we're now, everything on this logic model, we're, we're um, identifying and putting into our data system when it comes to the weekly outings and data entry. Um, and then this, what we're doing with the information is we're, we're pulling it together and we're analyzing it and we're putting it into these scorecards. And I didn't put a scorecard up here because it's really boring to look at. But it's a, it's a scorecard that, that basically takes every aspect of that logic model and says, here's, here's what I was doing, here's the goals and the, we have benchmarks on each piece of that logic model. We want two caregiver contacts a month. We want two teacher contacts a month. Um, at least four outings a month. That's on the service side. We want you to work in those categories of core assets. And then here's the, the where our progress is on the outcomes. Um, so we get school report cards. We do, once a year we do an annual assessment with kids. Um, and this is all just part of our program. This isn't the external researcher part. This is us saying, we need this information because we want every friend to plan every activity based on what's best for the kids. Um, so this scorecard system has been really fun. It's, in, it's improved a dialogue. Again, it's kind of given us a common language to talk, talk to each other. Because we have our sites, we have, um, uh, we're in like 10 different states right now. Um, and so we're in Portland, we're in San Francisco, and Los Angeles, and New York, and Austin, Texas, and Tampa Bay, Florida, and Boston. So very diverse um, group of people. But they're all using this common system. And so we have network calls, this bottom piece of network learning. We get together once a month and we, we share. We share how things are going. Um, we look at where the commonalities are. So for instance, school attendance has been an issue across all of our sites. They're not hitting the benchmarks we set there. And so we are now like doing as an organiz full organization, so creating specific tools to help friends work on school attendance. That's just one example. Um, so the scorecards are used by our supervisors, those team leaders, to work individually with each friend um, so you can bring them all the way down to a friend will have a scorecard that has all their kids on it, um, and you're looking at the individual kid level. Um, and then the, the program directors of each site are able to look at it by team. <laughs> and then all of us at the Friends National Organization, we can look at it by site. So I know it sounds really complicated and boring, um, but it's really actually <laughs> super exciting for geeks like me. And, and actually, what's, what's fun is that the friends are actually starting to like it too. Because you know what, what it does? And I remember this when we started this journey about four years ago. And there's, it's a culture shift. And some of our friends do not want that. You know, they do not, they are about the relationship. This is all about the relationship. My job is to build a strong relationship, and that is so true. Um, that is what we're about, creating connection. Um, however, you also want to get credit and for people to really understand how you're doing a good job and to be able to give you support when you need more help. And so it was hard to have that language of how to really articulate how to give support and how to ask for help. And so it's taken a few years, but I think that we're now in this place where we're really all valuing um, this system and how helpful it can be. Um, OK, but let's get to the exciting stuff, too, about our evaluation. Um, so right now, we are um, involved with a lot of evaluations that are third-party researcher evaluations. And um, every year, we do one at our biggest site in Portland that has over 500 children. Um, we, we, look, we track our long-term outcomes. And um, we're just really proud to say that 83% of our children are graduating from high school. Um, 93 are avoiding the juvenile justice system, and 98% are, avoid, are avoiding um, early parenting. 
Um, so these percentages are, um, you know, are what keep us going. Um, when you saw the, the, the cycle of, of how some of our children, the challenges that their parents have had, we really feel like we're onto something of breaking those cycles. We're also part of a randomized control trial um, that's being run by the University of Washington. And so back in 2007, we received an NIH, National Institute on Health grant, um, to launch a randomized control trial, um, which is really a gift. It's, it's something that very few organizations are able to secure the funding for. And we worked about 10 years to be able to get this study. Um, but what it's doing is it's looking at um, uh, children in New York, Boston, Seattle, and Portland, um, and tracking outcomes um, against a, a pure control group of children, uh, not pure, but they're a very, very, very randomized, uh, strong control group of children um, from each city. And um, it's, it's a very expensive, and we're, we're just so blessed to have it, and we're halfway through. <laughs> Um, and so right now, um, after five years of the program where kids are ages 11 years old, we are seeing those foundational behaviors that we would expect to see um, in the early years um, where our children, as compared to the control group, are exhibiting more pro-social behavior um, in the areas of uh, being on task at school, having um, less anger management issues, um, demonstrating a sense of belonging to school and family, um, and having self-confidence more than the control group children. Um, and then also similarly, um, we're, our children are getting uh, suspended less from school and are um, having less externalizing antisocial behavior indicators in school. So um, we're just, we're really proud of this. Um, it's, we were able to get an article, journal article published about these findings, and right now we're going back to NIH to get funding for the last five years of the study. Um, and um, we're hopeful that um, you know the adolescent years is really where we want to we want to be. We want to see how the kids are doing and whether those statistics I showed you a minute ago hold up under a more rigorous trial. Um, and so that's where we are. One of the things we're excited about is that 87% of our sample, we started with 281 children um, from, as you can tell, really high-risk families that are super mobile, going all over. And we have 87% of that sample still intact um, after, well, it's been almost 10 years now. Um, we did the first five years of the study. We've been in kind of a dormant period where we're just collecting data on the control group to make sure we know where they are. Um, and, um, and so we're hopeful. And one of the things that we're going to be doing in this second round of the study is um, not only to look at our long-term outcomes and just the general behavior of the children, um, how we're helping families. So we do parent surveys, um, youth surveys, friend surveys. We collect school data. We'll, in this new round, we'll be collecting juvenile justice data. Um, is, uh, is to really focus in on that social capital building. Um, that's an area that we really want to look at and see if our kids are more connected to their community, if they have more connections to other adults, um, because we really think that that's, that's one of the key ingredients. Um, we were disappointed. I don't know what it's like in Finland, but in our first round of the study, ah, we were really disappointed that we couldn't get accurate academic data, like quantitative academic data, enough of it from the schools. In elementary schools, it was very difficult to have uniformity and... Um, but it drove our researchers crazy and our, and our leadership of our organization because um, you really want to see what those grades were. But we're hopeful that this next round will be able to do that. Um, we also are doing a study on return on investment um, where we want to see, and I know that you folks have also done a similar study of um, how much are we saving society um, we had some researchers from Harvard dive into our expenses and the benefits to um, high school graduation on wages, um, the amount of money that is spent on teen parenting. Oh, here we go. Is this the tech? No way. Okay. Okay, let's do that. We'll take a break from this research stuff. That sounds great. Okay, great. <laughs> 
and I'm, I'm just going to skip through that since we just you just saw the video. We are um, right now in a, a period of doing a um, uh, a return on investment study, and um, I was it was interesting to learn that there's a there's potentially an opportunity for you to for Ice Hearts to receive a social impact be part of this social impact bond idea, um, but. That's what we're doing is we're trying to understand how much value we are to government. Um, as you know, in the United States, we don't spend a lot of money, public dollars, on children and families. Nothing compared to where you guys are. So we need proof points that we actually save the government money um, to be able to advocate for, for more investment. Um, so, and we are also exploring this innovative financing strategy called social impact bonds. Um, and what, what we're finding is that the people are most interested in our foster care outcomes right now in the early years. Um, that we've been, in the last four years, we've grown from one to four of our sites selecting children directly from the foster care system. Because we all know, sadly, that children who um, enter foster care often continue to struggle uh, because the foster care system is really difficult. Um, and so, we are um, hoping, we're analyzing data right now to see um, if we improve the outcomes for children in foster care. And to give you an idea, and then we think that government, or we've been told that government may be interested in investing in not only our child welfare outcomes, but our educational outcomes for kids who are in foster care. Um, and just, we're in the middle of the study, but just to give you an idea, that in, in the states anyway, if you're in foster care and you do not receive a friend, so we have, we did some analysis of kids that look like friends of the children kids at age five and six and what their long-term outcomes are if they enter child welfare. And it's just really sad. It's, it, it needs to be improved like tomorrow, yesterday. Um, but they stay in foster care an average of 3.2 years um, and that these children have about four and a half placements. Um, so they're jumping homes. Um, they're not making reading and math benchmarks at all, um, and that they're overrepresented in the juvenile justice system. And this is in Oregon. This is in one of the states that we um, operate, our biggest chapter in. And so right now what researchers are doing is they're, they're taking our Friends of the Children data. We have about 200 graduates in Oregon, and they're mapping the administrative data to see um, where our kids lie and then do some economic modeling to see how much money we potentially save by giving a child a friend. Um, so that's a new, kind of a new area for us that we're excited about. Um, and, uh, and it was interesting yet yesterday to talk to folks at Kella and others, you know, who are really, who also understand um, the value of the work that you're doing with Ice Hearts. And um, I really encourage you to keep Pushing your, pushing your data and in front of them because um, I think that they could see how they could make better investments as well. Um, and so our new area is innovation. What's the next horizon? So as you see here, we have a third party evaluation right now to do further exploration on our child welfare outcomes. Um, and we also, getting back to the parents, um, I, my personal heart space in, in this work is, is how we help more than just that child and the family, that we actually have a ripple effect on, um, fa on the, the caregivers and on the other children in the home. Um, it was really amazing to listen to your research the other day about the, the impact that you all have on the climate of the schools, that your teachers and that people in the schools are seeing that by having your amazing educators being their role models for, the, for a team, but also being there for the other kids is having an enormous impact. And, and we, what the Annie E. Casey Foundation in the United States, um, we were honored to get funding from them because they're really internationally renowned for their work on families. They invested in us last year to do some focus groups with our caregivers. And sure enough, you know, what we're finding is yes, that yes, we are having an impact on families. Families feel that we, we help them, we, these caregivers feel like they have a, their own source of support, that they're, they get more connected to the community as a result of Friends of the Children, that their parenting is better, um, that they just learn some new skills. Um, we had a grandmother once who, who um, came up to Duncan. Uh, we had just launched our program in Florida. 
and um, it was the first time we'd selected kids out of the foster care system. And a grandmother came up to us. She had been given the custody of her children, of her grandchildren, and she said, she tears in her eyes came up to Duncan. She said, "I I just have to meet you." She said, "You know, I." I've, um, it's just so wonderful to have some extra support by your friends. And she's like, I didn't even realize it, but having this man come to my home and spend time with my kid, my child, is making me realize that I had a really negative outlook sometimes on how I was approaching him, even though I love him dearly and he's my world, that just my language, and because I'm exhausted <laughs> and because I have so many things else going on in my life to take care of this boy, um, but that there's just strategies that your friend was using. And uh, anyway, they both started crying. Duncan cries. Everybody cried. And, um, and, and so that really was one of the things that made us say, you know, we really need to start looking at this. Um, and so that's where we're headed with that study. And then, um, and then, of course, I'm super excited about learning about RASA and <laughs> about how we are impacting the young adulthood of our kids. You know, what is going on in those later years through our adolescent study? What can we learn? Um, one of our, our, I think, our favorite uh, uh, pieces of success if we measure is that we've actually had one of our youth come back and is now a friend, um, which is just the ball game. You know, she's amazing and she's doing a great job. She now uh, works with eight of our adolescent kids and um, has three children of her own and is married to an amazing man. And so, you know, that's what else do you say, right? Um, so anyway, that's my story, and I, I take any questions, um, but again, thank you so much. I have so much to learn from you. It's been great. Uh, yeah, it's uh, nice to meet you. Last day, I lied to you, you know. You were watching about these uh, books, and uh, I said, sorry, we don't have a... Not one of those with your name, but we do have. Oh, <laughs> thank you. That's wonderful. There you go. When you're running, you can. I know, and I, I love how you're branded. <laughs> <laughs> I have a hat now. I have bottles. We could do better. Yeah. I want, I want some jackets. So I'm going to go back for friends and get some jackets. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. It was such a nice and warm presentation, so open and, and so warm spirit was there all the time. It was nice. Uh, ihan muutama ajatus vielä tästä koontina, jota niin Aishatsin malliin liittyy, jota itsellä tuli mieleen, että hieno tämä yksilöllinen aika viikossa lapsen ja nuoren kanssa. Meillä kasvattajilla on iso ryhmä eikä niin paljon aikaa. Neljä tuntia joka viikko sitoudutaan olemaan yksilöllisesti nuoren kanssa. Uh, yhdessä lapsen ja perheiden kanssa tehty roadmap, eli tämmöinen vähän niin kuin yksilöllistäminen niiden tavoitteiden, ydintavoitteiden mat matkassa. Aika, aika hienoja ajatuksia, joita voidaan miettiä sitten, että miten suomalainen yhteiskunta tuohon muovautuu ja muuten. Eli, eli aika hieno juttu.